Well, if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to open it uh, to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, um, to chapter 9, chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. As you're turning there, um, just remind you that Luke is one of four Gospels, Chronicles of the Good News of Jesus Christ, that give us um, outlines of his life, biographical outlines of his life, his ministry, um, from the viewpoint of God's inspiration through the lives of the gospel writers. Uh, we're going to pick up where David left off last week. I appreciate David uh, stepping in, did a great job uh, working through uh, the first part, kind of the first third of chapter 9, and we'll pick up uh, today with this portion and really uh, Jesus' ministry and the direction and the momentum of the Gospel of Luke changes in the passages that we read this morning. Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem and on his coming death and resurrection. Follow along with me, if you will, in Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 18. We'll read verses 18 through verse 36. Once, when Jesus was praying in private, and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul or self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angel. Truly I tell you, some are standing here, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. And his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. We pray with me. Father in heaven, we receive this as your 
true, trustworthy, authoritative, and sufficient word. God, we acknowledge you this morning as our creator and sustainer and redeemer. Lord, we come before you in humility and we pray that through your spirit you will speak to us by your word this morning, God, that you will use your word to do your work in your people by your spirit to your glory, to our good, and to the furtherance of your purposes in this world. God, we pray this morning for all the mothers in this room. God, for all the women in this room. For the glory of your image that they bear. For the participation in your ministry that they so strongly engage in. God, we ask you to be especially close to those in tender ways this morning who may be yearning to be a mother and not find that possible right now. God, for those who may have yearned to be a mother in younger years and that never came to pass. God, for those in this room who've lost mothers over the last year, God, we ask you to draw near to them, to give them peace, more than peace, Lord, to be their joy today. And God, we celebrate the ministry and the role that mothers have in the lives of families and of societies. God, as they raise disciples in their homes and as they shape and form the hearts and minds of the children you give them. Lord, we pray for those in our church who are hurting right now, those who are sick. God, those who are physically unable to be with us, God, we ask you to remember Lynn Griffin as she continues to recover from surgery. God, we pray for the community around us. Lord, especially for those who are lost in their sin, yet still diluted in the belief that they are indeed Christian, God. Because they prayed a prayer at some time, walked an aisle, Lord, or baptized. Father, we pray that you would remove blinders and give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive. God, we pray for our world so broken and torn by sin and violence, poverty and shame, and the misuse of power. God, especially this morning, we pray for Sudan. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ there as that country spirals out of control. We pray for the families of the children killed in Darfur. God, acknowledging that they are men and women, children created in your image, individuals for whom Christ died. Now, Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, Father, we confess our trust in you, the one who says that your word does not go out in vain or in any lack of power, but it returns to you always having accomplished the purposes for which you sent it. Father, we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, if we look at Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we see Luke coming out of, or we see Luke uh, chronicling Jesus coming out of some miraculous activity uh, that David preached through for us last week, and his disciples had seen him had seen him use less food than was humanly possible to feed more people than they ever could have imagined. And I want particularly for you to pay attention to just a few things this morning in the text we read. The first is the unique identity of Jesus. The unique identity of Jesus. You and I are all unique, but not in the sense that Jesus was. Let's look again at verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private, and, and you've seen again and again Jesus' desire 
to draw away from the crowds and the noise and the people and to be with his heavenly Father who was the delight of his very soul, the source of the power of his ministry through the Spirit and the one to whom Jesus sought most highly to be obedient and to glorify. And yet his disciples were with him. They'd drawn away with him. And he poses a question to them, and this question has haunted human history ever since. The question was posed to Pilate. And the question by God's Spirit and through uh, the agency of friends and families and neighbors and coworkers and classmates has been posed to men and women down through the annals of church history over the last 2,000 years. Who do the crowd say I am? Which will in just a minute turn in to a direct confrontation with the disciples. Who do you say I am? But at this point, Jesus says, hey, you guys are out here. You've been, you've been coming and going, involved in missions and ministry. You've been following me in and out of village, villages. You've been in the town squares. You've got your ear to the ground. What's the word on the street? Who, who do the people think I am? Who do the people think I am? I wonder what the answer to that would be if you ask your neighbors. Hey, I'm just curious. I was in church last week. I was in church this morning. I was in church a couple of weeks ago, and our preacher was working through a place in the Bible where Jesus' disciples were asked who people thought he was. And I, I'm just curious. Who, who, if somebody asked you, who do you think Jesus was? What are your thoughts? Sometimes gospel conversations are Truly just that easy. Everyone, at least in Western civilization and in our nation, has some idea of who they think Jesus was. I wonder what the answer would be by those you work with, by those you live by, by those in your classes. my friends of yours in your bowling league or whatever it is that you find yourself doing in downtime. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. If you'll remember earlier in chapter 9 in the passage that David covered, Herod the Tetrarch, was concerned about the same things. Verse 7 says that he'd heard about all that was going on, all that was happening as a result of Jesus' ministry. Can I just tell you, one of my prayers is that God, in his own time and his own way, by his grace and for his glory, gets so a hold of us as a church at some point that genuine repentance in our own lives breaks out, that a tremendous increase and our commitment to him and to his ministry in our local church here begins to characterize us all. That hunger for God's word and a thirst for God encountered in prayer and experienced in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of his son takes hold of us and things begin to happen that cause people around us and around the community to say, what's going on at your church? People ask that sometimes, not necessarily thinking about ours, but that question is asked often about churches, but not in the way I'm talking about. Herod was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. That'd be a problem since Herod had his head cut off. I don't know about you, I'm not in the head cutting off business. But were I, I would prefer that none of them came back. Herod's confused. Others say that Elijah had appeared. And still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back. So Herod's hearing this. The disciples of Jesus are hearing this. And they're confessing it to him now. This is what some are saying. Verse 20, Jesus gets to the point and says, Okay, 
regardless of what they're all saying, who do you say that I am? I wonder this morning what you would say. I feel confident what most of you would say. And yet, I run into people all the time who will confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Son of God and yet have no desire to submit their lives to Him. To repent and bow before Him. Confessing Him to be Savior and Lord. Who do you say that I am? Peter. <laughs> Peter. Who we like to bag on so much. But man, we could use more Peters. We could use more men and women who may be prone to make mistakes at times, but their passion for Jesus is redlined. You with me? What they are not going to be guilty of most of the time is staying quiet when they should speak up. Is sitting down when they should be walking forward. Is not caring when they should be driven toward things with a holy discontent. Peter says, you're God's Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one to whom all of history to this point has been looking for. You're the man. You're the one. This powerful confession of Peter that he, in the not so near future, not so distant future rather, would deny himself, though by God's grace be restored, was exactly what Jesus was looking for. Exactly what Jesus was looking for. In verse 21, Jesus strictly warns them not to tell this to anyone. Because here's the thing. Though, though Peter had said, you're God's Messiah, you're the Christ, you're the anointed one. You're the one who was to come. There was still tremendous confusion about what that meant. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that the way he was going to go about restoring the kingdom of God and bringing the kingdom of God looked nothing like the people thought it would. And I'm telling you, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Much of how God works in your life, much of how God works in his church, much of what he does in his church that is truly of him does not look like we would imagine it. It doesn't look like we would come up with in a, a boardroom with a vision grid. Because he's sovereign and he's good. And he sees things you don't see. He sees things I don't see. In your life this morning, in places where there's tension and turmoil and trouble, God sees things you don't. And he says, hold on to me. I am all powerful and I am good. And I love you and I know you by name. I know you by name. Your elders uh, spent a few days this last week at Parkside Church in Cleveland, Alistair Begg's church at a conference there. And Sinclair Ferguson uh, was one of the men who was there with us and who brought a series of messages on the holy and high calling of gospel ministry in the local church. And one of the things he said is he said, uh, he said, it astounds me that I, I think people forget that when when they can see the preacher, the preacher can see them. When they can see what the preacher's doing on a Sunday morning, the preacher can see what they're doing on a Sunday morning. And he talked about how it's, it's not just your gaze that's upon us. In so many ways that operate at such a deep level, it's hard for those called to do this to express. Our gaze is on you. And our affection grows for you and I think sometimes you forget that you you may pray to God you may call out to Jesus but you forget that God is looking at you that Jesus is listening to you he's fixed his eyes upon you even as you're called to fix your eyes upon him he has called you his beloved 
He has called you his treasured possession and made you so and declared you to be that which you are not in and of yourself. The righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Peter says you're God's Messiah, but they don't understand. They don't understand how God is going to go about doing what he does through Jesus. Verse 22, he said, the Son of Man, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as he repeats these predictions of his suffering to come, and yet, when it begins happening, the disciples are still confused. They still don't get it. My concern so much for, for those in here, I can't see your souls. I don't know your soul. I need to see mine, and by the help of God, know mine. But I can say with confidence that there are churches all around our land who are filled with people this morning who will verbally acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, but who have never experienced regeneration, have not bowed to Him, thrown themselves on Him in an acknowledgement of their wretchedness and sinfulness, asked forgiveness, acknowledged His Lordship, and receive the new life that God gives. That great 19th century Anglican bishop, J.C. Ryle, said this in a, a, a somewhat lengthy quote, but one that I find completely disturbing. God's truth disturbs the spiritual laziness of men. It obligates them to think. It makes them begin to talk and reason and speculate and invent theories to account for its spread in some places and its rejection in others. Thousands in every age of the church spend their lives in this way and never come to the point of drawing near to God. They satisfy themselves with a miserable round of gossip about this preacher's sermons or writer's opinion. They think this man goes too far and that man does not go far enough. Some doctrines they approve and others they disapprove. Some teachers they call sound and others they call unsound. He's describing here the, the heresy hounds, the doctrine dogs in every church that are always on the watch. But if you just stand back calmly, whose lives often and hearts often betray a total lack of the transformation and love of Jesus Christ. Ryle goes on year after year, finds them in the same state, talking, criticizing, fault-finding, speculating, but never getting any further. They are hovering like the moth around religion, but never settling down like the bee to feed on its treasures. They never lay hold of Christ. They never set themselves heartily to the great business of serving God. They never take up the cross and become thorough Christians. And at last, after all their talking, they die in their sins unprepared to meet God. Friends, if you leave this room this morning in that state, your guilt is on your own head and no one else's. If you look at Jesus' title here, Son of Man, and think back to the book of Daniel. Back to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Give me just a second to get there. You can get there if you want to, or you can look it up later and see that I'm telling you the truth. Which you should do. You should do. You're smart and sensible people. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. As you're looking at this description of the Son of Man, Jesus too, very familiar with Daniel, and comes at some point, we don't know when or how, through the agency of the Father to understand himself to be that Son of Man that Daniel was talking about, the one to whom all glory and authority would eventually be given. But his glory and the fullness of his authority would come on the other side of his suffering. And so it is for so many of us as Christ followers. In the Christian faith, suffering precedes glory. Suffering precedes glory. Joel Steen will never tell you that. Joyce Meyer forgotten it. But this is the biblical gospel. That suffering precedes glory. Next, I want you to note the high cost of following Jesus. Jesus says it's not just he who's going to suffer. But his followers will at some point endure suffering for his sake. Look at verse 23. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Must. He doesn't say there's a few categories. There's the, there's the Bible Belt category in the southern and midwestern U.S., and, and they're allowed to be mediocre followers of mine, to grab a hold of me when they're scared or when they need a spouse or when they've got a test coming or when they got news from the doctor that they weren't looking for. But then there's premium followers of mine, the special forces. And to them, all to deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus doesn't say that at all. He said, anyone at all who wants to claim my name and receive the benefit of forgiveness and new life, reconciliation with God, that comes with that must, is required to deny themselves. Huh. If there has ever been a society in human history that is the antithesis of denying themselves, it is us. You ever been through a drive through window and you asked for two packets of ketchup and they had the gall to give you one? Right? I was going, I'll just say this, I'm fat and you can see it. So I was going through a drive through at McDonald's the other day and um, she asked me what I wanted. I said, a, a double quarter pounder meal with cheese, mayonnaise only. I eat like, like a baby. Um, and do you know that that girl at the window had the nerve to give me just a quarter pounder? She should know it takes a lot to fuel this. Only one patty in there, not two. There's something in us. There's something in us as born and bred and proud consumers that will have no part in denying ourselves. I have an email ready to go out, so I won't let you in on all of that. You'll get it uh, then. But uh, one of the, the latest, most ridiculous things from uh, all of the, the campus unrest of the last few weeks was, was the, uh, the 24-hour hunger strike by some of the faculty of Princeton who have been rightly maligned and belittled and made fun of online. One guy was like, oh, you mean intermittent fasting? I do that once a week. That's nothing. Ah, we're so full of ourselves, of self-worth, and our pseudo-sense of intellectualism and pride. But Jesus says, you can't follow me that way. I won't have you. I won't receive you. You deny yourself. You take up your cross daily and follow me. The daily helps us understand that Jesus was speaking metaphorically. He was using symbols and imagery to teach us something about following him, though it might come to that one day. And his earliest disciples certainly knew they could be crucified, and some of them were for following him. But when he said daily, they understood it was more than that because they couldn't be crucified every single day. What Jesus is saying is you have to be prepared to pay whatever price the world throws at you for following me. If you're not, you cannot belong to me. This is the high cost of following Jesus. 
Verse 24, he explains why. Because whoever wants to save their life will lose it. You've got to let it go to receive the true life that God gives. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And then he says, what good is it anyway? What good does it do to you to gain the entire world? All the beauty, all the wonder, all the money, all the congratulations, all the power, and forfeit your very soul. Forfeit your entire sense of self. And friends, some of you have lived long enough to see success destroy people. Jesus isn't just talking about some kind of supernatural, eternal reality. He is certainly speaking to that. But there's a forerunner to that that happens in our lives today. Where it is completely common for tremendous amounts of money and fame to absolutely destroy the soul or the self of the person getting it. Jake and I took in a Guardians game. The real team is called the Indians um, in Cleveland while we were there. And we we're looking up some player salaries, and I was telling Jake, it would have not benefited me at 19 to have been making $4 million a year. Would not have been good for my soul. Though I have no doubt Sharon would have liked me to chance it. And see if by the time she met me at 21, she might be able to fix some of that and work it out. Listen when it comes to this, to the eloquent, to the historic, to the profound words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who sealed his testimony here with his own life as a young man for the end of World War II, as he and other confessing Christians resisted the nationalistic embrace of the church in Germany and sought to defy Hitler in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship. I know many of you have read that. I think, Ray James, wherever you are, I think you said you read it last year. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. Friends, that comes at the moment that you hear God's call to redemption. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ. In union with his death, we give over ourselves our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I quoted that months and months and months back in a message. I got an email from a man that was attending at that time. He's no longer here, but he was so undone by my assertion that to encounter the gospel and to come into the gospel is to encounter an invitation to come and die. And he said, that's not the gospel. That's not the good news. And this wasn't a, a first time unconverted guest. This was a, a long-time churchgoer who, interestingly enough, though, had not put down roots and become a member in a church. I felt for him he couldn't have been more wrong on that point. This is the, this is the invitation that Jesus sent us. It's very clear here from Jesus' own mouth come and die. The Apostle Paul knew this. This is why in Galatians 2.20, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, Paul's still living. I hope you know that he was still alive when he wrote Galatians. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I've denied myself. I've taken up my cross. It's a daily process of repentance and denial and fixing my eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of my faith. I wanted my life to be saved by God and in God. Therefore, I released it. And in Christ, I found it. This is what Paul is saying. 
Yet among so many, there is no hint of this kind of attitude, this kind of discipleship that says, where God says yes, I say yes. Where God says no, I say no. When God says go, I go. When God says stay, I stay. When God says speed up, I speed up. When God says slow down, I slow down. When God says hear this, the word of the Lord, I by his mercy and grace open my ears and my eyes and my heart to receive. News article just yesterday I saw about the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who was speaking at the Oxford Union and Oxford University. They do this once a year, a couple of weeks ago, uh, April 25th, I think, if my memory serves me right. And she talked about, in her opinion, the, the danger of populism in the United States and the, the, the danger it is to the democracy. And she labeled those who have a sort of popular leaning politically as poor lost souls looking for solutions, but unable to accept the ones that she and her party are giving because of their views on guns, gays, and God. Pelosi is herself a self-described, I want to read it exactly from her lips, devout Catholic. And because I was preparing for this message, I thought about, I thought about that. I thought about the delusion of believing I'm a devout Catholic when on every social and ethical issue of our day, I stand on the opposite side of Catholic teaching and doctrine and of the very scripture and truth of God itself. It's not just Nancy Pelosi that can delude herself, friends. It's you and it's me. Jesus is Lord of all, or he is Lord of nothing. He's not partially Lord of some of my life and partially Lord of some of yours. He's not Lord over certain domains of the world, but not others. He's Lord of it all. And this call to, to die is something that we're struggling with. But I'm telling you, if you're following Jesus, you're going to have dreams in your life that you're going to have to die to at times. You may have sin that you dabble in just enough because you keep believing the lie of Satan that God's not good and that he's going to take you from the little reward that that sin's going to give. And you wind up on the other side with the same guilt, the same shame, the same committed determination not to do that again. You've got to die to that with Christ's help. We'll have to die to desires that contradict God's truth revealed in Scripture. This is where our Methodist brothers and sisters have gone so terribly, terribly, terribly wrong. Which I will also comment in written form on to you. Let me just say with all tact and gentleness, whatever you wrestle with, whatever struggle or desire you feel, the God who raises Jesus from the dead is the same God who speaks truth to us about sexuality, and gender, and marriage. He doesn't speak truth to us because it just excites him. He speaks truth to us because he has designed us and created the world and longs to see human beings thrive and flourish, those made in his image, called by his name. And even in the church, we bought into the lie that whatever I desire and whatever I feel must be right, or at least we have bought into the lie that to say it isn't in love is mean and intolerant. And that is an echo that finds its source in the pits of hell right now. As young men and young women are destroying themselves to the applause of so many of our politicians and our media figures today and even to some in the church. We need to have enough integrity to say, you may have to die to a desire in this life to follow Jesus. So do I, so will you, and so will others. But there's nothing, there's nothing that God cannot deliver us from or sustain us even in joy throughout a life unfulfilled. You with me? We are not the first Christians to encounter desires that are contrary to Scripture. 
that for us to follow Jesus, we have to say no to. Anything less than that is at least a false gospel. If not worse, the very marching orders of hell itself as it destroys and divides not just men and women and families, but Christians and the church, at least in the West now. The church isn't so confused around the world, but we are in Western civilization. Last thing I, I want to make sure you notice this morning is the hope of glory. The hope of glory for those who belong to Jesus. Don't miss this, this powerful, yet somewhat enig, uh, enigmatic, I can't, I can't think of the word I'm trying to say, ambiguous, uh, mysterious passage about the transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said all this. Well, let me hit verse 27 because if I don't do that, you, you won't hear anything. Truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Part of why this confuses us is because we've heard kingdom of God and said uh, equals heaven afterlife. And that's just wrong. It's wrong in the New Testament. It's wrong uh, when we think about it that way. Um, Jesus is not saying some of you here will not die before the end times and the end of the world and the inauguration of new heaven and new earth come. Some will say he's, he's talking about uh, them seeing the transfiguration. Maybe, we don't know. There's some we just don't know about, verse 27. Seems unlikely to me, though, because it's just eight days away, Luke says. So it's very likely that not just some of them, all of them, we're going to probably make it the next eight days. Because the assumption is that some of them aren't. I think what Jesus is referring to, and you can go study it and look at it on your own, is the coming of the, the next large block in the inauguration. Jesus has already said he's here and the kingdom of God is here in that inaugural sense. But not in the sense that it comes in a, a, a kind of um, partial fullness in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit into his church and his ascension as the, the visible first fruits of the kingdom of God in the people of God crossing genders and racial boundaries and all kinds of socioeconomic dividers comes as a glorious witness to, God, uh, to, the, to the world of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of them are going to live to see that. All right. Eight days later, he takes Peter, James, and John up onto a mountaintop to pray. Verse 29, as he's praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. You remember somebody else that went up on a mountain, took a few with him, they waited, he went up, and he encountered God, and his, his radiance was so changed that it terrified the people. Anybody remember somebody else like that? Shout it out. Who is it? Moses. Yes. Yes, Moses. Exodus. We just saw this a few weeks ago. Exodus 34. It's no, it's, it's no accident that Jesus is replaying that now. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. In glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, exodus, literally his exodus, his coming crucifixion. And with that, by implication, his resurrection, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Think about this. I want you to, I want you to not miss the glorious hope, the hope of glory that we have, those who belong to Christ. Here is Moses who's been dead nearly 1,500 years. Here's Elijah who's been dead nearly 900 years or at least absent from the earth. And they're here and they're fine and they're with Christ. They're talking to him. Moses' body's buried. And yet Moses has agency to talk and to listen. And they're here in the splendor and glory of Christ. Here, in just a moment, the thin veil between heaven and earth, between this life and the life to come, is pulled back a bit, and we see how truly thin it is. Church, your loved ones who have gone on in Christ are doing fine today. They are with Him in glory and splendor, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies and their full glorification where we don't know what we'll be like, but we know that when he comes back and he will return physically and bodily, we will be with him and we will be like him. Don't miss 
the hope of glory that belongs to those who belong to Jesus. They're talking with him, and think about Moses. Moses, who guided the people all that time. Moses, chosen by God. Moses, who was allowed to see the promised land, but not go in it, and here he is, and he's in it. Talking with the one to whom his ministry and so much of his prophetic utterance was pointing toward. Elijah, who his prophetic utterance was pointing toward. They're talking to Jesus. Jesus is filling them in on the Father's glorious plan to bring all this about. Scripture tells us even angels long to look into and understand the mystery of the gospel. Peter and his companions were sleepy. There you see a a, a precursor to Gethsemane. But when they woke up, they saw the two men standing with Jesus. They saw him in his glory. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said, Hey, Master, it's, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Luke comments here and says he didn't know what he was saying, though. Peter didn't understand the implications. They couldn't stay there on the mountain. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. They didn't deserve three tabernacles. Only one of them deserves a tabernacle. The other two are simply servants. Simply servants. While they're speaking, God sends a kind of tabernacle of his own. A cloud appeared and covers them. And they're afraid as they enter the cloud. And a voice comes from heaven. You remember, this has happened before, twice saying, this is my son. And then the wording is a little different. Whom I have chosen, listen to him. This was Moses' parting words to his people. This is the word of the Lord. Listen to it. When you and I run our own ways, friends, church, we, we run toward our own destruction by not listening to God's word. The same word that those who listen to Find it to be sweet as honey on their lips when they listen and walk in obedience. I have chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. I'm not going to close it all the way, but I want to remind you of a couple of things. Deuteronomy 18. 15 through 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses as he's preparing to end his time with the people he's led so long. One from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. You hear the the word of the Father hearkening back to Deuteronomy? For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb. On the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his great fire anymore, or we will die. They knew they needed, they needed an intermediary. They needed someone to stand between them and God. The Lord said to me, verse 17, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command. Remember, that was Jesus' own confession. I don't tell you my own thoughts and my own words, but everything my Father commands, I pass to you. Malachi, we see Moses and Elijah together. We see them playing their prophetic roles and preparing for the great and final prophet to come. Malachi 4, the last book of the Bible, of the Old Testament, the last verses of the Old Testament. Verse 4, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he will turn your hearts, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Elijah and Moses both pointing forward to the one that was to come. Jesus is the tabernacle of God. He's the incarnation of God's glory. And you know, John, you know, John and Peter, they didn't forget this. That's why John writes in chapter one of his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You go down to verse 14 and John says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, Father, full of grace and truth. You think in the back of his mind, as John, moved by the Spirit, is writing, he's not remembering that moment on the mountain, that moment of transfiguration, where they saw the glory of Christ in full? Peter. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 18 says, We didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Peter pulling together the different versions, the different times, instances of God speaking. And then he says this, verse 18, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mount. Friends, when you and I, by God's grace, get a hold of the hope of glory that awaits us and all who truly belong to Jesus, it will leave you changed. And it will fuel you to live differently. Let me end with this, where we began as Jake read Psalm 2 at the beginning of the service. Psalm 2, the psalmist writes, Why do the mountains conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. So for those of you who are are so undone by the, the cultural demise of the primacy of the church in our society in our country, who who are so stricken at times by the utter godlessness being legislated in our nation, approved and celebrated and promoted, know that God is not shaken, that he looks down at all the attempts of man, all the attempts of any nation of any time to overthrow his glorious purposes in his gospel And he laughs. He scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Now verses 7 and 8. Then I'll pray. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance the ends of the earth, your possession. Psalm 2 is not highlighting how great David is. Psalm 2 is looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, his transfiguration, his death and resurrection, and his ascension and installment as the reigning and ruling Lord of the universe who knows your name and cares about you. And who, if you are not in him this morning, is calling you this morning, is my hope and prayer that you'll throw yourself on him. And if you do, I want to see you after the service. Trust me, mom will be fine. She'll be glad you came. Because if you turn it down, you walk out. You walk out and the guilt is on you and no one else. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that every word I've spoken this morning in your name and for your glory would come straight from you. God, if anything I've spoken does not, I pray that you will strike it from the memory of those listening. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that in Christ, in Christ, we find a new and unique identity as sons and daughters of the King. That in Christ and through Christ, through His power living in us by the Holy Spirit, we are able to deny ourselves, to say yes to whatever cost the world may require of us, to claim
proclaim the name of Christ, to follow Him, to acknowledge Him in all areas of influence in our life. And God, by Your goodness, we do have a hope of glory because we belong to Jesus. And when the veils pull back, we see that those in Christ are safe in Christ and kept in Christ until that day. Father, as we prepare now to receive offering this morning, to hand in connection cards with commitments on them, God, we acknowledge this as a, a sacred time. God, where you call us to give back a portion to you as an act of worship and acknowledgement of trust. And God, I pray that you'll bless those who are about to do that. God, bless those who've done it this week online or by text. God, those who've mailed in checks. God, that their commitment to you would be honored and would be honoring to you. God, be with us now. Help us to respond to you. I pray in Jesus' name.